most uh, sort of basic uh, lipid panels, as you said, will measure total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Is is ApoB a better measurement, a better predictor of, of cardiovascular disease if someone's wondering about that and whether they should go to the effort or cost of, of ordering that? And, and also, where does non-HDL kind of come into this conversation? Yeah. So look, ApoB is the ball game. ApoB is the signature of the particle. It's carrying cholesterol. It's going to induce atherogenesis. Particle number is the primary driving force in the artery wall. So ApoB would be the best test you could absolutely do. It's rather cheap. And look, in the United States, it's available in every lab. And your cash price is 10 bucks. Yeah, you know, labs, you know, if labs could say, oh, I want 90 bucks for it. But most labs will give you a cash price. Third party payers often say, no, I'm not paying for that. That's an experimental test, even though <laughs> it's not an experimental test. The data is overwhelming on it. So if you can't, for whatever reason, get an ApoB, and I've gotten emails back, hey, I'm in Canada, I can't get an ApoB, and perhaps other countries in the world, maybe you have to see a specialist before you get ApoB, I don't know. But so if you're stuck with a lipid panel, the only reason you're doing a lipid panel is twofold. There's one lipid concentration that you have to know, and that's triglycerides. For two reasons, there are two types of triglyceride disorders. One where the triglycerides is well above 500. That's a rare genetic disorder. If you have that, the mission in life is lower the triglycerides to prevent pancreatitis, not heart disease. Then there's everybody else who has a triglyceride less than 500. Most typically, they're diabetics or insulin-resistant people. And most typically, their triggers are in the 140, 150 range, not 400. And in those, ApoB becomes the goal of therapy. So triglycerides is important to exclude the rare hypertriglyceridemic disorders. Everything else in the lipid panel is just a poor man's guesstimate of ApoB, a poor man's surrogate of ApoB. So let's start with the total cholesterol level. Total cholesterol is the cholesterol in every lipoprotein in your plasma. LDL cholesterol plus VLDL cholesterol plus HDL cholesterol Normally, we're doing fasting, so there are no chylomicrons contributing to cholesterol levels because they disappear rapidly postprandially. So here's the trick, though. So if you get a total cholesterol level, 80% of that cholesterol is in your LDL particles. And what is an LDL? It's an ApoB particle. So total cholesterol is a super poor man's surrogate guesstimate of ApoB. At what level should you be concerned? Above 200, you've got a definite serious ApoB level. I personally think above 150, you want to run out and get an ApoB test to see where it is. So 150 to 200 would cer should certainly suggest to a clinician or a patient, you've got hyperbeta lipoproteinemia, too many ApoB particles. All right, let's jump to the test everybody talks about, LDL cholesterol. Well, remember, 90% of your ApoB particles are LDLs. So obviously, LDL cholesterol has a pretty high correlation with your ApoB level, far higher than does total cholesterol. So if I see you have an elevated LDL cholesterol, should I just assume, hey, you're an ApoB uh, issue here and we're going to take care of it? No, because as good as it correlates, there are exceptions to the rule where the LDL cholesterol is quite low, but your ApoB is still high, or conversely, your LDL cholesterol is high, but your ApoB is normal. Those situations are said, hey, the two laboratory metrics are discordant. Normally, they agree with one another. They're concordant. So when you discover a, a discordance between ApoB and LDL cholesterol, Trial after trial after trial has shown risk follows ApoB better than it does LDL cholesterol. So therefore, I don't want people coming up to me and telling me, oh, Tom, you're going to be so proud of me. I got a great LDL cholesterol level. Great. What's your ApoB? Oh, I don't know. Then don't even talk to me until you go get an ApoB. If your ApoB is also low, but if your LDLC is super and your ApoB is high, you have a risk that is not identified by LDL cholesterol. I'm one of the authors on a paper in diabetics where LDL cholesterol is 50 
And about 20% of them still had high LDL particle concentrations. And yet they would be told, hey, your LDL cholesterol is 50. You have no worries whatsoever. Wrong. Discordance. All right, the final. Now, well, let's get HDL cholesterol out of the picture here. That's on every lipid panel. Tragically, for years, it was called the good cholesterol. We know now that's an idiotic terminology. Uh, so what is HDL cholesterol? Well, it's the cholesterol that's in all your HDL particles. Now, HDLs are not the cholesterol, they're not the lipoproteins who crash your artery wall and dump cholesterol. There's no ApoB on them. So they're not per se part of the atherogenic uh, uh, milieu that causes the disease. But Framingham, when it first came out, said, geez, people with, and that's an epidemiological study in the United States, people with low HDL cholesterol seem to be rather high risk for atherosclerotic disease. And study, Mr. Fitt came in and other epidemiologic studies seem to confer that, that yeah, LDL cholesterol is worrisome, but if your HDL cholesterol is low, it doesn't even matter if your LDL cholesterol is low, you're still at risk for heart disease. And study after study after study showed that. So much so that the lipidology world started developing all drugs that raised HDL cholesterol. Because if low HDL cholesterol is bad, if we raise it, we'll cure you. And every one of those trials has failed using a drug that raises HDL cholesterol. There was no cardiovascular outcome benefit. So now that took 30 years to happen. So it's easy for me to say now we know uh, treating low HDL cholesterol doesn't matter. But here is what really why low HDL cholesterol might be a risk factor, might not be. All of those early studies that came out and said low HDL cholesterol is bad news were never adjusted for apolipoprotein B because they didn't even have ApoB studies in those days. So we now know if you have low HDL cholesterol, immediately return to the lab and demand an ApoB level. And you will see by far the most common cause of of Low HDL cholesterol is insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. If you have insulin resistance with a low HDL cholesterol, your ApoB is through the roof, and that's why you're going to get atherosclerotic heart disease with your insulin resistance. Statins, uh, ADA mandates statins on everybody who's a di diabetic above a certain age, and it's for that reason to get rid of the atherogenic ApoB-containing particles. So low HDL cholesterol is a poor man's guesstimate that you probably have a high ApoB. We do know now there are people with low HDL cholesterol who do not get atherosclerotic heart disease. And we know there are people with elevated heart uh, HDL cholesterol who do. So you can never make an individual decision based on HDL cholesterol. If you want to tell me, hey, that Norway's got higher HDL cholesterol in Zimbabwe, all right, there'll probably be less heart attacks in Norway than there would be in Zimbabwe. But that never translates to an individual patient where you have to zero in on the causal agent. So please, those of you who have low HDL cholesterol, measure ApoB. And if it's high, your therapeutic goal is not to raise HDL cholesterol. That doesn't work. It's to lower ApoB. Okay. The last metric, uh, and an important one if you can't get ApoB, is you mentioned non-HDL cholesterol. Well, what the hell is that? Well, obviously, listen to what it is. Non-HDL cholesterol is the cholesterol that's not in your HDL particles, right? <laughs> you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to understand that word. So if cholesterol is not in an HDL particle, what type of lipoprotein particles would the cholesterol be in? There's only one other class of particles, your ApoB particles. So non-HDL cholesterol is the poor man's lingo for ApoB cholesterol. And obviously, in general, ApoB cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol, has a high correlation with ApoB. It's actually a higher correlation than does LDL cholesterol have to ApoB. So, non -H if you can't get ApoB, you're going to look at your LDL cholesterol, but even if your LDL cholesterol is fine, but your non-HDL cholesterol is still abnormal, you almost certainly have a high ApoB, and you need your LDLC might be a goal. Now you have to get your non-HDLC to goal. What you really have to get to goal is your ApoB level. So here, the one problem I still have with that, where ApoB is so readily available and cheap, is 
Yes, non-HDLC is better than LDLC, is better than total cholesterol, but ApoB is better than any of them. There's nice studies published that shows there's even discordance between ApoB and non-HDL cholesterol, where the non-HDLC looks pretty good, but damn it, the ApoB is still high. That person needs more aggressive treatment. So those are your lipid measures. You do those, you throw in an LP little a, and you're off to a pretty good start on at least ascertaining lipid and lipoprotein mediated risk. The sort of take home message there is if you want to get a really good idea as to how many of these ApoB containing lipoproteins are crashing into your artery wall and potentially causing this um, cascade that leads to atherosclerosis, ApoB is going to be the best test, followed by non HDL cholesterol, followed by LDL cholesterol, followed by total cholesterol. Yeah, but think of non HDL cholesterol. I said, hey, it's the ApoB cholesterol, but how do we? come up with that number. You take total cholesterol, the cholesterol that's in all of your particles, you subtract from it the HDL cholesterol, and you're left with the ApoB cholesterol. So it's a simple calculation that anybody uh, who's graduated grammar school can do, uh, and it's easy. Of course, somebody's going to have to teach you what are the normal levels, but uh, it, you want to look at that. If you get it done in a lab, they probably have a little chart there that tells you what the risk ranges are. But uh, I think we all got to know them all. So I don't want you to go out and just do an ApoB and not look at the rest of the lipid panel. I think all of the information is useful. If you really were cash strapped, I'd say the really only two, once you get LP little a, and that's done with forever, the only test you really need is triglycerides and ApoB. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can basically say the big three then are ApoB, LP little a, you're going to do that once and triglycerides. And if you have those three, you can really predict your risk of atherosclerosis. Yep, you've passed lipids 101 if you understand that. Mm -hmm.